Well, fair enough. All right. Well, we're recording, so we can go ahead. Looks like Urban's first with Blue Keep. I saw some yeah, so um, uh, Blue Keep has been out and, out and about. I mean, it's more out and about because people are still using outdated operating systems. Uh, according to this article, they had they've seen 700,000 or, so, or so vulnerable systems that still need to get patched. Uh, not to say that the patch isn't out there. It is out there. And uh, it's just people still using old machines because, you know, to them, if it's not broken, don't fix it, even well, though it is. But. Not necessarily old, right? 2008 R2 and Windows 7. Windows 7 is not at end of life, is it? Yeah, I think it is. Oh, okay. It could be. Ooh, I don't yeah. pay attention anymore. Yeah. The, yeah, all the other ones are. Yeah, okay. Uh, the the art the other article that I that I tied with it comes from the Internet Storm Center mm -hmm. about uh, when when you try to exploit this attack, yeah. uh, you have to change your tool a bit because it by default once once you launch this attack, the if you use like Nmap or something, it's not going to see that it's vulnerable again. You have to change the timing because the you know, the CPU is getting used up. So it's not going to respond as fast as it would prior to getting attacked. Yeah, that's pretty drastic. I saw this. Um, uh, mass scan fails and Nmap works because you need to give it a 30-second timeout instead of 10 seconds. So that's really terrible. 10 seconds yeah. to the TCP handshake. You know, this is a sloppy attack. I've seen this before with um, NTP amplification. If you exploit the server so drastically that it becomes useless, then obviously you'll get caught and they'll clean it off if you had any sense. You'd be less greedy and only use 50% of the CPU, and then you might be able to run it for a while. This is stupid to burden it. So right, right. Anyway. This, is, this is like the, the canary in the coal mine. Hey, wait, why is this taking longer? Yeah, during an NTP application attack a few years ago, I went and found a site that listed them all, and I was actually going to notify the colleges, but I realized there's no point notifying them because nobody can not notice that. So, right. As soon, they all get hacked and they immediately have to patch it because the server goes down. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. <laughs> like yeah, the of an ATP. Anyway. Yep, yep. Anyway, that's the first one. Yeah, yeah. Let's see now. Oh, I got this one. Yeah, so this one I saw. It's kind of obvious in a way, but it is a point. You have these uh, smart speakers, and you can activate them with sound. And I thought the clever attack was you can put um, funny sounds on, or even maybe perhaps even inaudible sounds that it will interpret, but you can also hit them with a laser. And if you modulate the laser, they interpret that as sound because I think just thermal heating. But anyway, you can shine light at these things and issue it voice commands and it will understand them, even from quite a distance away. So, you know, in principle, someone could exploit your system this way, although it sounds a little ridiculous to me, but it's not that different than the one that came out decades ago with uh, um, Tempest, where they can shine a laser in through the window and bounce off your computer and see what you're typing by the vibrations or, or pick up the radio signals you made it, you know. In principle, it might be possible if you have a really high value target, but I don't think this is gonna be a normal risk for normal people. Anyway. That's pretty cool though. Yeah. Pretty cool attack. Yeah, it is. It's an interesting bit of physics. Anyway, and then it's kind of interesting to think like, okay, well, something like that, like the Tempest, like there's a window right here. Is somebody gonna go across the way, try to shoot a laser across, and isn't the laser gonna get distorted when it hits the window, depending on the kind of window that you have? Well, no, not really. All you have to do is get some reflection back, and then you look at the modulation. Yeah. And so, but still, it's. I know the the one that makes more sense is you can actually use Wi-Fi to shine through the wall to see where the people are, and that actually works. How does yeah. that work? It's been around for a few years because the Wi-Fi radio is so big that it goes through the wall to a certain extent. So you can get a like blurry picture of the layout on the other side of a wall using um, Wi-Fi with millimeter. Kind of like radar. That's like cool. Radar. Oh yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. That's super so, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Like you, whereas, you, whereas this one's using actual light, the other one's using the radar. Yeah, and so like if you're in a hostage situation, you could like actually find out how many people are in the room and where they are and whether your cot's okay for the cops to like sneak in or something, that sort of thing. Anyway, um, yeah. So my first one, uh, we uh, we've talked about we've talked about this a little bit over the preceding weeks. Uh, uh, DNS over HTTPS, and it's interesting because uh, the ISPs have been fighting this. Um, the reason they've been fighting it is because it would prevent them from, um, you know, capturing and monetizing all their uh, subscribers' data. 
and selling, you know, selling it to other companies. Uh, but uh, Mozilla, um, Mozilla is trying to convince uh, legislators to take a look at this because uh, it's kind of problematic. Well, I've heard. <laughs> we'll see about, if they get anywhere. But see, I've heard about this for years, but I'm not sure I believe it. For example, I have Comcast. How is Comcast monetizing my data? I don't see any ads on my webpage that appear to come from Comcast, so I don't understand how they're monetizing well, my data. They just sell it to other. They sell it to other entities. The, that's where the real money is. It isn't necessarily in running their own uh, marketing programs based on it. It's in selling that data to other companies that will then do things with it. So the this website I'm looking at right now somehow is connected to my ISP, and they've chosen ads based on that. I really well, think so. I think it's all just Google. No, no, that's not really what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is that Comcast will take the data from your usage, um, your usage history, usage data, stuff like that, where you go, and then sell that to third-party companies uh, who will then use that data in other ways. Perhaps they'll use it for marketing. Yeah. Uh huh. And in fact, one of my later stories, I'm going to talk about that a little bit, but. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, that's where the real money is, and is in selling, selling uh, massive amounts of user data. I thought the real money was targeted ads. There's more money just in generic it, information? It is, and that's why, and that's what drives the high rates of, uh, you know, the more explicit, the better on consumer data. Hmm. Because those targeted ads, those targeted ads function by taking in uh, large data sets on you and what you visit, what your preferences are, what you look at, and then um, and then pitching things to you based on that. Now, I think some of them are pretty hilariously bad considering some of the items that have been uh, advertised to me lately. I mean, comically <laughs> bad, but... Uh, you know that doesn't stop that that doesn't stop it from being a pretty uh lucrative market hmm. right. it sounds kind of backwards right of you know yeah. targeted ads seems to be the the way to go but okay well no they the targeted ads utilize the the consumer data um that's how that's how the targeting works they yeah. uh they pull they build as complex and tailored of a profile of you as possible and oh. then uh uh, use that to pitch the products to you and that way uh, theoretically they have a more uh, efficient use of their advertising resources because they're pitching you stuff that you're more likely to uh, buy or get suckered into clicking on okay so it's not individually targeted it's targeted by like demographic groups right this, the political polls that say black people vote this way and rich white people vote this way they sort you into groups yeah, uh, essentially, um, and and those categories get more and more nuanced as as time goes down, as as they uh, winnow down, you know, as your interests are more specialized. Well, that makes more sense, I guess. Yeah. All right. And here's the pet feeders. This is Urban, right? Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. wow. So, yeah. Um. So furry tail is not associated with the the main company uh the main company that tell me tell me um they say oh uh we basically uh they're using our name but it's not our device therefore we don't care about it therefore stop telling us about it uh -huh. passing passing the risk on uh to the other company Yep. So anyway, these are just another IoT hack, right? They got in with some. Yep. So you can use these things, I guess, to mount a DOS attack on somebody or something. Yeah. Yeah. Easy to get into. Easy to to turn into a botnet. And the, yeah, the main company is going. That's not our product. We're just licensing out our name. Yeah. Well, that's usually the case. Nobody's actually responsible for anything. So this one I thought was pretty good, and I heard it in a podcast. Um, there's all this noise about trying to do something about uh, the way Facebook is using political parties, which is pretty amazingly effective, and people are very upset about it. And this woman was hired to fix it. Um, she was hired to be the head of global elections integrity ops, and they said she could choose her own title. But once she got hired, they immediately put her in some group, and someone said, no, we're changing your title to manager. And then she found out that when you actually submit any 
um, proposal to change anything about how they target political ads, you immediately get shut down. They say, oh, no, you're changing our revenue model, and this will never pass, and you can't even get to any higher level. And then she found there's a bunch of other people that have been hired by Facebook to improve these ethical things, and they all get the same treatment. They just get shuttled to the side, given no power until they give up and quit. So they, they hire people and give them a title so they can say they've done that and then just quietly shove them off so they don't do anything. And the point is just what everybody, everybody hates Facebook. They're like the king of being unethical the way Microsoft used to be. And evidently it's quite true that they have no intention of doing anything right. And uh, they're basically just a tyranny ruled by Mark Zuckerberg and he has some weird ideas and uh, they're just going to keep ignoring they're deliberately letting people put up fake ads in politics, and Mark Zuckerberg appears to be the authority of what's politics and what isn't. So yeah. it's basically so people are, yeah. So people are complaining that they're getting paid to do nothing. Well, she our, quit. our well, students she, would love that. Well, <laughs> well, I think it's worse. Like many people, she's paid to do something impossible, and she can't do yeah. it. She quits. But for example, one of my students uh, years ago was told me he got a job as the first team of engineers to secure Adobe Flash like 10 years ago. <laughs> I said, I don't really know whether to congratulate you or offer sympathy. These <laughs> <laughs> people are basically human sacrifices. So they say, okay, fix it, but you can't change anything. And then when you fail, they say, you go out and bums and throw you under the bus. And it's not until the second or third wave that they finally say, well, I guess we're going to like actually have to allow you to change something. Yeah. Anyway. So uh, it was interesting to get the details that, as far as any, I can tell, Facebook is exactly as bad as you think they are. And this is why stuff like Libra sunk like a stone, because they say, what? Let you people handle money? How stupid do you think we are? <laughs> anyway. Uh, so, e-skimming. What is e-skimming? Okay, so, you know, we talk about, uh, we talk about credit card skimmers and um, yeah. skimmers on ATM machines and gas pumps and stuff like that, where they will steal your credit card info and uh, same thing happens on websites. In fact, um, I think I remember, um, I think I remember seeing this actually uh, in, out in the wild uh, with one client who I worked on and basically there are a few different ways that this attack uh, happens, but it's becoming more and more uh, widespread. Um, and I think it's just a, I think it's just a fancy term for an old, old problem. So essentially there are a variety of holes that you can have in your website um, that can enable attackers to steal your user's credit card info. Um, and often, like, during the uh, payment transaction process. Yeah, and I know they can defeat two-factor authentication, too, yep. by protecting your phone. Yep, yeah. Uh, account takeovers are uh, a big problem here. And, you know, companies really, for the most part, I've, only, I've seen a lot of uh, bad setups with this. And I, I'm not really sure what the answer is. Um, you know, there are a few good ideas out there. But, uh, you know, I've... I think a lot of companies really haven't considered this as a problem. So it's good. Uh, you know, I, I don't necessarily think an official FBI warning is going to help, but it might, it might help the lone, like one guy on the IT team who's been uh, yelling at them for years to change their insecure configuration. So, yeah, I get these things. I don't read them much, but I know some people on the more bureaucratic uh, corporate and government right. read them. I mean, and this, what I'm saying is maybe, maybe now that there's an official warning, they can say, see, I told you we have to do something about this. So, well, yeah. yeah. I found that to yeah. be helpful. An official government document helps right. to persuade people to exactly. care. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm saying. Yep. Yeah. So hopefully uh, getting the awareness out there too, you know, like Irvin's uh, talked about before with small businesses, one of the biggest things is, is getting people to even know that this is a problem. Yes. Yeah, that's, and also compliance standards. Yeah. Which yeah. I like a lot more than I used to, especially now that I'm teaching in class and I have a student enforcing compliance. I have a lot more respect for compliance than I used to. Yeah. Well, I'm watching, I'm watching what it does. It takes an IT shop that is just a mess and it forces you to like obey common sense rules and get organized. Uh huh. And valuable. Anyway. Yeah. So a bunch, of, a bunch of malicious apps again in the Google. Yeah, a bunch of malicious yeah. apps for, the, for Android. Um, at the bottom, there's there's like five pictures with the list of the apps that if you have them remove them 
along with the hashes for them and their package names. Uh, this is one of those PSAs. Uh, <laughs> if you if you have any of these apps, get them off your phone. But the amazing thing is that Google never fixes this garbage. Their store is just full of malware over and over and over and over. It's, yeah. The Google security model is very strange. Everything is signed with a self-signed certificate. It's like, it's yeah. just amazing. Anyway, this just keeps happening yeah. over and over and over, and it's a fundamental concept of their model. Mm -hmm. Anyway. So you totally cannot trust stuff just because it's in Google Play. Whereas if right. it's an Apple store, you can really trust it. That's a huge difference. Anyway, all right. And uh, I've got, oh yeah, this one I thought was very interesting. And what's funny is it wouldn't load in class last night, but now it's loading again. So I, one time I was teaching uh, in the lab and one of the students came up to me and said, uh, you know, I want to find out, I've got like a felony record. And I don't know if I can get anywhere in security. And I'm like, well, actually you can. It means you can't get government jobs, but there are other people who don't care. They're private sector jobs to get. And so don't give up. And a whole bunch of students were like gathering around me. Oh, I think I want to hear this too. So I realized a <laughs> lot of my students have felony records, far more than I would have guessed. And so this guy was in prison for life for murder. And they had some kind of training program in the prison with IT and he got in it and then he got let out of prison and now he's got a real job in Silicon Valley developing stuff. And I thought this was very helpful, especially they have his, um, his cover letter that he sends people. And I'm pleased to see that the advice I gave him then is the same advice this guy has. Let me find his cover letter um, there in your cover letter. He says, look, I'm an ex-con. I went to prison. I got out. If you hate me, you can throw this letter away right now. But really, I've reformed. Ah. I said, no point lying about it. Don't try to hide it. Just come out with it. If you don't hire ex-cons, I won't waste your time. But maybe you'll give me a chance. And that worked, which is what I would think. There's no point trying to hide a thing like this. Then they'll hate you when it comes out. Anyway. Right. But a bunch of people do understand. You know, some people have reformed, and you should give them a chance. Anyway. So I got I got this article actually from a friend who uh, helped work on that program. It's uh, at San Quentin, um, and they teach their they teach folks how to uh, code, how to write code, uh, yeah. essentially, so that they can be equipped for a developer job once they get out. And then I think one of the crucial things about it too is that they also um, kind of support them as soon as they get out and help them transition, like. Like one of the things mentioned in this article was that they picked him up at the, once he got released, they picked him up outside the prison and then kind of put him up in um, sort of a halfway house deal for like six months until he um, was ready to do technical interviews and uh, go out there and, you know, actually get into a job. And I think, I think that's a huge part of preventing recidivism because one of the main issues is that, you know, we, talk about how we, we incarcerate these people for years and then they quote unquote, you know, pay their debt to society. But then once they're out, they can't uh, get any kind of lawful work. So yeah. no wonder right. we have such right. a problem with recidivism. Yeah. No, I really Sounds like a good program. Yeah, it is a really good program. And they've been, it's been going for a while now and their outcomes have been really impressive. Yeah, I'm all for this. I think it's awful the way in America we just throw people away like trash. And we, and we really should be training them to do something when they get out of prison. And we should do something for the homeless people. I mean, there's a bunch of people that we just ignore. And we should be taking care of them and guiding them back onto a good path. Yeah. And I mean, part of the rest of the issue is, too, you turn them loose uh, on the street with $200 and nothing else. And I mean, this guy had been in prison since he was a teenager. Uh, so what are they supposed to do in that right. situation? Yeah, so, we create right. problems later. Just like yeah. a lot of activities in the Middle East, we just create a problem for the next generation by doing the wrong thing. Yeah, we just set people up to fail as soon yeah. as they get out. So Yeah. And then we blame them for it rather than us. Right. Well, this comes from an old-fashioned you know, Puritan idea that what matters is that they should suffer enough to balance the cosmic scales. And I really don't care about that. I think what matters is protecting society. Yeah. And I think making someone suffer is not important. Rehabilitating them so they can be productive and not a problem anymore is what really matters. Anyway. Right. But I guess I'm a bleeding heart liberal. But, <laughs> um, 
soft on crime. So <laughs> I guess it's got a couple more here. Yeah, I thought this was pretty interesting, actually. Uh, you know, we know that companies collect data on us, but uh, I thought that at first off, the author is actually pretty great. You had her come speak in your class, uh, Kashmir Hill, oh, yeah. um, and I got to meet her. She was really cool. But this was this is a really just an excellent in-depth article about some of the more uh, modern and recent companies that are aggregating all our data on us and and buying your info from Comcast. So. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one of the interesting ones that I thought in uh, I thought about in here is called uh, SIFT, um, which aggregates a lot of data, like like from everything to like Airbnb to what you've ordered uh, off of like Yelp food delivery over the past five years, and. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to get, I, I, I actually went through the steps in the, in the article and tried to get some of my reports from these companies, but I have yet to hear back. So, um, and, and one of the things they mentioned was that barely anyone actually asked for their data. So since it was in the New York Times, I'm guessing they are probably overwhelmed with requests <laughs> for uh, reports. <laughs> And we'll see if they we'll see if they get back to me or not. But uh, it's just it's interesting because it's essentially like just like China's social credit score system, um, but farmed out to a bunch of private companies such as Equifax and and stuff like that. So uh, it'll be interesting to see. First of all, it's completely wild wild west on this stuff since we don't have anything like. We have zero controls over any of this stuff. Uh, no GDPRs. See, it'll be interesting to see how this uh, changes with the California Data Privacy Act um, when that uh, takes effect in January. But uh, it's a good article. Yeah, I would certainly like to see disclosure. So at yeah. least we know how many people are taking our data. And uh, I, I listened to part of an a debate on in a podcast where they were saying Europe has in fact strangled their tech companies and that's why they don't have any big valuable free services like Google and, and stuff because of all their privacy which is excessively burdening companies and I don't know if that's true but that's one argument um, I don't know if it's true either but I'm I'm essentially sort of okay with that trade-off if that's the case um, but I mean I don't know if it's true either because you can still get like free proton mail and stuff so yeah uh, right. Uh, it does sound like something that you would say if you really want those, uh, <laughs> if you really want those laws relaxed, so you can go back to uh, profiting off people's data that you've mined. Well, my impression is that nobody actually cares about the consumer side. The only thing that's currently fashionable is to get all mad about the political side. But we'll hmm. see what happens. Sure. Uh, one of the things I thought was really interesting about this article, just one standout, was. Uh, when uh, she was talking about SIFT, it's, uh, one, one sentence stood out. She said, it knew that I used my Apple laptop to sign into Coinbase in January 17 to change my password. Like, how the hell, the, <laughs> how the hell does it know that? What, and what else does it know? Well, I guess your yeah. ISP would know. What's that? Your ISP would know. Actually, they shouldn't because of HTTPS. They should, they should know what site you went to, but they should not know what page you visited. Or your, uh, you know, well, I guess, yeah, I mean, I guess you, no, well, I mean, I guess uh, you can still see user agent and maybe. Um, no. Right, the, the unencrypted part of the headers. Yeah. Well, I you can see, you can see the original handshake to get the certificate. And after that, everything should be encrypted. So all you should know is the domain name. I wonder if. Coinbase, the, and what I was going to say next is I wonder if Coinbase uses a separate authentication, like a, a domain for authentication that has identifying details. Yeah, I doubt it, but that's possible. Yeah. I want to know. I want to know how this, I want to know how this uh, third party service knows that. That was yeah. the standout yeah. from the article. Like how, yeah. how the hell do they know that? <laughs> well, that's a good point. Yeah. And, and there's one more here, which I thought is really important. Oh yeah. So I just, uh, this was just sort of a little, uh, just sort of a little bonus article that I thought was actually pretty well written. Um, a lot of the stuff in this, this area tends to be, uh, sort of 
screaming into the void, I guess, or uh, some, you know, maybe too far one way or another. But I thought that this was, uh, I just thought this was a really good piece about kind of the current state of affairs with uh, yeah. the way these situations are here. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people really aren't aware of uh, the fact that this is a legitimate concern for a lot of people. I think the women are aware. Every woman sure. I know says they've been harassed and, and have trouble. And I, th I think it's only a bunch of men that are in, still in denial about it. And I think the well, whole Me Too movement is to knock that off. Yeah, and I think a lot of that's just um, not having had to go through it. Like I was talking with a friend of mine who was like, oh, yeah, well, I never worry about riding Bard on night. I feel writing Bart alone at night. I feel perfectly safe. And I'm like, yeah, you're like six, two and 200 pounds. And you look like you would like break someone in half with your hands. It's a little different for you, you know? So I think that, uh, I think that it's one of those things where, uh, you know, one of the, one of the issues about it is that uh it's not talked about in a way often not talked about in a way that uh is very constructive and i think that this i i thought this was a really good piece uh on it uh, i think this is changing i've seen an awful lot of headliners at security conferences that are now talking about emotional issues and work-life balance and this sort of thing they're they're kind of getting away from this macho male culture where all the men pretend that everything is fine and don't talk about their feelings. I think we're getting away from that. I think so to some degree, but then there's a lot of backlash against it for one, because there's a lot of anger that, uh, you know, the status quo is being challenged from a lot of guys who've been used to functioning this way for the last, uh, you know, 20 or 30 years. And I also think that, um, I think that there can be, uh, I think that there can be a, a lot of the times in a corporate setting, especially the stuff is explained away or brushed under the rug because I mean, it's just like with any HR department, the HR department isn't there to protect you. It's there to protect the company. And, um, well, I'm think, stunned that they just fired the CEO of McDonald's. Oh, yeah. A consensual affair with the subordinate. Yeah. Uh, complaining. That is... I was I surprised. You thought that would happen. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that especially massive companies like that, when it's somebody yeah. in an executive, uh, a prominent executive role, are especially averse to um, uh, risk of, of poor public opinion. And you I, know, I wonder if they just hated him and this was the excuse. I know that's what happens at the college. There's that's, people they hate, and so they wait for some excuse to get rid of them. That's possible, but it's also kind of shrewd uh, risk mitigation because, yeah, okay, they find out about it, and for all they know, it's consensual. But then, you know, what if things go bad and that right. subordinate is called, you know, tries to uh, make a big case out of it and say well they pressured me into a relationship or right, you know, right. my conditions in my employment uh him well, doing that or whatever well then you'd have a lawsuit and the company wouldn't be held too much liable you know I, i'm surprised they chose to fire the ceo over this i would think just a censure or something a much smaller remedy would be justified but anyway maybe it's it's that change that that liz is talking about yeah well yeah. Well, I'm much more cynical than that. I assume this yeah. is a marketing position where they want to appear to do something. Like most <laughs> Apple's encryption stuff is so they can pretend they're protecting you from the government, which is all garbage. Anyways. Yeah, I thought that was interesting, though. I wonder, too, how closely, uh, I wonder how closely they work together. Yeah. Because he also was a board member at Walmart, and he stepped down from that. So it makes you wonder if there's more to the story that we don't know. Yeah, that seems right. much more likely that in fact he was doing a lot more and they're just using this as the excuse to get rid of him. Mm -hmm. If that's all he did, I don't think they could fire you for that. I mean, that's anyway. All right. Well, are there any more comments? No. Well, I guess that's it. I'll stop the recording. You'll see you folks next week. All right. Okay.